and I'm a software engineer at Azavia, which is a geospatial software and services firm in Philadelphia. And um, I'm going to be talking about um, a data set and some tools that uh, we've created uh, for detection and segmentation of clouds in optical satellite imagery. So uh, this data set is um, made up of uh, Sentinel-2 tiles uh, that uh, contain clouds. And uh, we've asked uh, some professional label labelers uh, to label those clouds. And uh, we've uh, released that as a data set. Uh, according to NASA, uh, some 70% of the Earth's uh, surface is covered by clouds at any given time. And um, um, in an optical context, uh, obviously those clouds can uh, reduce the usefulness of imagery. So um, being able to detect uh, and or suppress those clouds uh, in an automatic way is um, something that is of value. And so uh, that's the motivation for this data set. Uh, this data set allows you to uh, train machine learning models uh, and or test machine learning models uh, uh, to do just that task. So uh, we've uh, released uh, this data set uh, to the public uh, and uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Uh, but we've also uh, developed some tools uh, around it and including some models that we've developed. And uh, we also uh, have a tool for um, uh, uh, collection of um, cloudless mosaics at large scale uh, that uh, we've developed as well. So uh, those will be some of the topics that I uh, touch on today. So um, yes, the, the data set that we uh, have created uh, consists of uh, 32 unique Sentinel-2 tiles. And um, within our data set, we have both L1C, that is, um, what is it, top of atmosphere, and uh, L2A, uh, which is a surface reflectance or atmospherically corrected versions of each tile. So um, we have uh, 32 unique tiles, but there are uh, 64 uh, total raster files uh, within our data set. Um, and uh, those tiles cover about uh, 25 unique locations and um, various biomes are represented like uh, tundra and uh, equatorial forest uh, cities, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we also have a representation from all four seasons within our data set. And um, these uh, our labels were created uh, by um, our partners uh, at the company Cloud Factory. And um, they were able to create these labels uh, using uh, a tool called Groundwork, which is um, a fine Azavia product that we've developed. Just to talk a little bit more about the data set, uh, it is uh, composed of rasters in GeoTIFF format, and uh, the labels are vector labels. Uh, uh, in particular, they are basically GeoJSON, but uh, they're stored in the stack format. Uh, the uh, spatio spatiotemporal asset catalog format, which is um, a, um, a format that uh, Azavia is excited about and uh, a number of our products use it. Uh, it's um, meant to facilitate, um, I guess, easy interchange of geospatial data of all kinds. And uh, all of these data are uh, available in a, a freely available uh, requester pays AWS bucket. So, okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, here we're looking at um, the groundwork interface that uh, the labelers used uh, to produce the labels. And um, I'm showing you this to show you both the interface uh, as well as uh, the labels themselves, uh, sort of on top of and contrasted with the actual imagery. So uh, this is a, one of the scenes from our data set. And um, as you can see here, it's uh, a pretty cloudy scene. And um, I can uh, toggle these labels on. Let's see here. Yes. And so uh, these are what the labels look like uh, that were uh, produced by our human labelers. 
this is an entire Sentinel-2 tile. So this is actually like quite large. There's, I guess it's um, something on the order of 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. So you may not be able to get the scale of this tile from this view, but uh, this is quite a large, uh, quite a large tile or quite a large image. And it's been uh, painstakingly uh, hand labeled by our, uh, by our human labelers. So a lot of data there. And uh, we have uh, 32 of these. So uh, here's another one. Um, I just am showing you this to kind of uh, contrast it to the previous one. You'll notice that uh, over here in this uh, tile, we've got um, these um, puffy clouds. I'm not sure what the technical name for them is, but um, uh, that can be contrasted to this scene that contains um, these kind of uh, wispy thin clouds. So I'm just trying to convey to you the um, diversity of clouds that uh, appear in, in the data set here. Okay, and uh, here's a third scene. And uh, again, just trying to show you the diversity of the scenery here. Uh, this one again contains puffy clouds. It also contains like some highly reflective sand that's uh, light in color. So, um, if you would like to um, access this data set, um, probably the easiest way is to um, clone this GitHub repository or clone or visit this GitHub repository that's listed here um, because uh, there's a file within the repository um, called catalogs.json. And uh, basically that contains the locations on S3 uh, that gives the locations of where the imagery is and uh, where the labels are. So let's take a look at this uh, catalogs.json file. Uh, I'm not going to go into great depth about this. I just want to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. So uh, yes, it's basically just a collection of um, uh, dictionaries that kind of relate um, particular imagery with uh, the corresponding labels. And once again, this is a, a stack, a spatio-temporal asset catalog. Uh, um, I've got some links to some resources uh, at the end of this presentation uh, that you can uh, access if you want to learn more about this format. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've got a uh, L1C as well as L2A versions of all this imagery. Um, this catalogs.json file only lists the L1C versions of these, but uh, the L2A ones, um, you just uh, simply replace uh, capital L1C with capital L2A. And that's, uh, that's where the L2A versions of these images are. Okay, um, so I can talk a little bit about um, the cloud model that we've uh, built using this uh, data set. The, the meat of that is contained in a file called pipeline.py. And um, even if you're not um, necessarily interested in using our models, uh, you might want to inspect this file because uh, it gives you a concrete example of uh, how to interpret stack labels as well as um, the, uh, the correlation or the uh, correspondence, I guess, between stack labels and the L1C and also the L2A imagery. So um, it may be worth your time to give this a look. And um, uh, so now talking a little bit more about our models, uh, we built our models using raster vision, which is um, another uh, fine Azavia product. And this is our uh, framework for geospatial machine learning. So uh, if you've not heard of it, um, I, I recommend that you uh, give it a try. So yes, our, uh, we've, we've produced um, models of uh, two different architectures uh, using, the, um, using our data set. And uh, let me talk about that now. So um, the, the first of these architectures is um, a, an FPN with a, a ResNet 18 backbone. So this is kind of a fairly traditional uh, deep learning uh, type model. And um, 
I mention that because I would like to contrast it with our other model type, which is uh, Cheap Lab. Uh, Cheap Lab is uh, a, a, model, a model architecture that we developed uh, at Azavia. It is um, not a deep learning architecture. It is um, actually pretty shallow and pretty small. It is um, kind of designed to mimic uh, the behavior of um, various normalized indices. Like uh, you might recall that um, many of the indices uh, come in the uh, basic structure of band A minus band B over band A plus band B, that kind of shape. Uh, basically what Cheap Lab is, is an attempt to learn um, that kind of family of functions. It's trying to learn that family of functions uh, except learn it um, in a way that's uh, optimal with respect uh, to the data that are given rather than being somehow prescribed or somehow um, developed from knowledge. The idea is to be able to train more uh, a generalization of those kinds of indices uh, from data in an automatic way. Okay, so just to compare results, we have this uh, traditional uh, deep learning architecture the uh, FPN in the, uh, the first row L1C and the second row, the results on L2A imagery, uh, both quite similar and both with uh, recall uh, precision and F1 scores in the low 90s. And uh, that can be contrasted with Cheap Lab, uh, where the recall is um, kind of in the uh, low 80s or upper 70s. Uh, the precision is kind of in the mid to high 80s, and the F1 scores are in the low 80s. So on Cheap Lab, um, at least in terms of um, these metrics, doesn't perform as well as uh, the deep architecture. But the thing that um, is nice about it is that it's um, it's quite small. So just in terms of um, on disk size of the trained models. Uh, I think uh, cheap lab models are typically around 40K, and that can be compared to these uh, FPN ResNet 18 models that I think, if memory serves, are around 80 megabytes or so. So um, just uh, the, the on-disk size, I think, should give you a, um, a, uh, an idea of uh, the difference in the number of parameters. So a cheap lab is actually uh, able to be used on um, CPU instances. So if you want to um, do some inference um, at large scale using inexpensive instances, uh, that's sort of the use case for cheap lab. Uh, I'll walk through some of the results that we have, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about that last topic uh, a little bit uh, later. Okay, so just... Uh, this is just showing some imagery. Uh, so this particular image uh, doesn't exist within our data set. So this is not part of the, uh, the cloud model data set. Neither this tile nor this location is present there. And um, this is just showing kind of example results of uh, the cloud detection here. Um, I'll go into more detail about this in just a minute. Okay, so um, here is uh, that tile that I just showed you, uh, except uh, this time it's in QGIS. So uh, I've got some of the, uh, the results loaded up here, and I can kind of uh, compare and contrast uh, the results for uh, the deep model versus the cheap lab model, uh, as well as uh, an ensemble of both. So. Um, I'm not going to be uh, scientific about this. I'm just going to kind of zoom around and show various things. So I can show uh, the results for the ResNet 18. And you'll notice here that it generally does uh, pretty good, except um, in this particular case, it does uh, miss, it seems to miss some clouds here uh, in the middle of the screen. Uh, it does do a nice job of um, appropriately um, not mislabeling some of these uh, lighter colored um, buildings uh, that are down here at the bottom. Uh, so uh, those are the FPN results. Let me take a look at the Cheap Lab results. 
so you'll notice here that uh, Cheap Lab um, is able to detect uh, some of the clouds that uh, the FPN missed. Uh, you'll see that go back and forth, like there'll be instances where the FPN will see clouds that Cheap Lab doesn't, and um, vice versa. So uh, they both uh, seem to have um, their respective strengths, uh, as well as their respective diff uh, weaknesses. So um, although the um, objective numbers that I showed you a couple slides ago um, seem to clearly show the FPN is much better, uh, subjectively, uh, it's uh, less clear. And uh, But one thing that's nice is that one doesn't have to choose one or the other. You can use an ensemble of the two. And uh, we did actually uh, seem to find that ensembling uh, multiple FPNs and multiple cheap labs with each other um, produces nice results. Uh, much of the time, you do subjectively seem to hold on to the strengths of both while um, not necessarily inheriting the weaknesses of both. So that's nice. So that was my Greenwich tile. Uh, let me show you another one. Uh, just trying to give you uh, an idea of how things work on different kinds of clouds here. So this one is a little bit more interesting because we have some uh, clouds over water and some wispy clouds as well. Uh, here's the FPN results. You see some of these uh, clouds being missed here. Uh, the cheap lab uh, results um, show that uh, those clouds are being picked up by cheap lab and um, if you look at the ensemble uh, you'll notice that uh, yeah i mean it does uh, it does a reasonable job of, of finding uh, i guess maybe the inner parts of these clouds uh, if you're wanting to make sure that these clouds are removed you can um, take some buffer around these areas of detection and um, maybe be reasonably confident that you'll that you'll be getting everything. Or uh, another strategy might be to take the or of the results of the two uh, architecture types. So there's uh, strategies for dealing with these, but um, that's just kind of a, a flavor of what you have there. So um, what are the applications of some of these models? Well, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, cloudless mosaics is uh, one uh, is one uh, application, and uh, we have been able to um, make use of Cheap Lab uh, to um, produce um, cloudless mosaics at pretty large scale, like we've done entire continents before, and uh, we've had uh, a reasonable degree of success with that. Yes, uh, the tool that we um, have for that is called Cloudbuster. Uh, so basically what it does is it um, uh, runs, it, it makes use of a cheap lab model. Again, uh, able to do that on inexpensive CPU instances. And it uses that to basically um, infer clouds in uh, a number of tiles over the same location. And then uh, basically composite those together, the cloudless portions to produce uh, cloud-free mosaics, or at least mosaics with fewer clouds. Uh, so uh, here's an example. Uh, and um, one thing that um, Cloudbuster is able to do is um, it produces a, um, uh, so it, it adds an extra band within the um, result that it produces that um, basically allows you to track uh, the origin of the pixels that it used to produce a particular image. So in this particular case, uh, this is showing you uh, the source pixels that were used to produce this composite image. And okay, so um, here are a couple more resources that um, you can access if you're interested. If you're able to obtain a, uh, a version of this slide deck, uh, you'll be able to um, click on these links. Uh, these are just a couple of links to um, some writing that uh, I've done about uh, the topics that I presented. So uh, in particular, uh, we have a blog entry here on our cloud model, and we also have a, a blog entry here um, specifically on the cloud data set, uh, uh, walking through how to obtain that and uh, how to use it. So uh, thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, James. Uh, we will welcome him now to the stream. Hello, James, how are you? Hello, how are you? I was a very, very nice and clear video presentation, so thank you for that. Uh, we have some questions for you. First, uh, can users download the cloud masks to use them in their workflows? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, there is, um, you can go to GitHub and uh, inspect the file uh, catalogs.json. Uh, in the chat, I've also provided a link to the slides, which uh, provide a link to that file. And within that, uh, you'll find where those live on S3, and, and you can uh, simply download them. They're in a request or pays bucket, so uh, you're free to get both the imagery and the labels. That's great. Um, also, are there specific use cases where the L1C product is more appropriate than the L2A? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't have any firm examples to hand, but um, one plausible example I can come up with is maybe if you're wanting to transfer a cloud model to a different imagery type, uh, it may be the case that um, L1C is more useful for you than uh, L2A in some contexts. Okay, thank you. Um, have you also labeled cloud shadows? Um, no, we haven't. Uh, that um, perhaps is a bit of an oversight. Uh, so it's possible that we may um, take a second um, bite at this apple and per perhaps uh, produce some labeled cloud shadows. Uh, we're also uh, actively um, doing research into how to detect those shadows uh, automatically. So um, yes, that's definitely a topic that we're interested in, but I, I don't have uh, anything to share with you at this time. Okay, great, thank you. Um, can the model detect different cloud types, example, cirrus, thick clouds? How does the prediction compare against the cloud mask provided with the Sentinel-2 data? Okay, uh, I'll answer the, uh, I guess, the first part first, yeah. maybe the second part first, I'm not sure. Uh, so in terms of cloud types, yes, I, I think you saw in my um, prepared video there that uh, I tried to show that we were able to detect both like puffy and wispy clouds over land and water. Um, what I showed you was kind of heuristic and unscientific, but generally speaking, the answer is yes. Now, when you ask uh, how, how those compare to the cloud masks, that's actually a bit of a complicated and interesting question because um, where a cloud begins and ends is kind of a subjective question. So you have a bit of subjectivity in the labels in terms of interpreting their correctness, et cetera. So generally speaking in the labels, an area of large, like a, a, an area covered by a large thin cloud is typically labeled as one big cloud. That's typically how it looks in the labels. But uh, the definition again of what is a large thin cloud versus uh, just mist, where that line is is subjective. So um, uh, it, it'll be up to you a little bit. Okay, great. Um... How well did your cloud mask perform in ice, snow regions as far as labeling accuracy? Okay, so in terms of how well the labelers did, um, let's see, that is, that is, that again is a tough question to answer um, because um, I, uh, so just by visual inspection, it's difficult for me to tell the difference between um, it, an area of permafrost and a cloud in some contexts. So uh, I'll say that um, I will suspect that they did a fine job, but uh, I, I have no um, uh, I have no objective proof of that statement. Okay, thank you for that. Um, does the Cloudbuster model guarantee image recency when reconstructing cloud-free mosaics? Uh, indeed, yeah. Cloudbuster um, accepts a number of parameters, so you can kind of control the um, window of time over which you're willing to accept imagery. So um, you can narrow it down uh, and be more certain about uh, when uh, pixels were born, uh, or you can um, make it more wide if you're just wanting to be certain that you are able to cover an area. So that's all controllable. 
Great. Um, another question is, uh, do you use all bands on Sentinel-2 to train the model? Uh, indeed, we do. So for the models that I showed you, that's the case. Uh, but of course, if you'd like to take a subset, uh, you can um, take our data. And uh, I think that you can modify our code to do that. Or of course, you can use your own training code as well. So uh, that's all, uh, all open to you. That's cool. <laughs> Uh, did you consider augmenting your data with other multispectral imagery? Uh, in, well, not, not multispectral per se, but um, we are interested in SAR. Uh, there was a, a talk, uh, a couple talks before mine that uh, discussed that topic. Uh, that's a logical choice. Um, so in terms of, um, I guess, um, compatibility with uh, other multispectral imagery, uh, yes, I, I think we don't have plans to produce a data set, but uh, in terms of being able to transfer models, uh, that seems like something that should be plausible. So, uh, and in fact, internally, we've had some success doing that, uh, not with cloud models, but with other, uh, in other similar contexts where we've uh, transferred Sentinel models to other, uh, to other uh, uh, imagery types. Uh, I don't see any more questions for now. Uh, thank you very much, James, for your nice presentation and all the questions and answers. Um, I don't know if you have some final comment you want to share with us. Uh, no, I, okay. I just like to thank you for your hospitality and um, everybody have a nice uh, conference. Okay, thank you very much, James. Um, okay, uh, see you around uh, next days. Okay. okay.